Well, hi, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I hope I'm not a disappointment to Dr. Levine or you all by not having more of a Southern accent. I am originally from Nebraska, and in spending a decade in Virginia, I still don't have much of a Southern drawl, except you might hear me say y'all once in a while. Um, I'm really excited to be talking to you all tonight about what I chose to describe it as teamwork. Um, when I thought about what I really want to share with you all, that's a word that came to mind, but it's somewhat interesting that when we think about teamwork, um, we often think about sports or business. Um, if you do a quick Google search of the word teamwork, you'll see a lot of pictures in both of those areas. But if you think about the original team, what would that be? The family, right? Um, and that's what we'll be discussing more tonight. Um, of all the very cheesy teamwork pictures and quotes that I found, um, I thought this one best describes what I really want to share with you all tonight um, as we explore ways to engage the full family in nutrition education, specifically in the setting of pediatric weight management. Um, and seeing over 3,000 families in this specialty setting, I've learned a lot, mostly from my patients. And um, we've learned about what works and what doesn't work in this setting when it comes to the nutrition piece. Um, and especially through um, emphasizing and building the strength of the family unit. And I'm very much looking forward to sharing what I've learned with you all tonight. Um, and it's definitely an honor to be here. More than anything, what I want you all to walk away with tonight are some practical strategies of how to engage the full family, as well as tools to promote positivity, if, even in the face of frustration, because that's bound to happen. Um, and also give you some ideas on how to work with a family um, and a child to help build a healthy lifestyle. Now, we've, before we dive into kind of the structure we'll be talking about, I want to get a little feel for the audience. So who here works in pediatrics? Awesome. Who here works in pediatric weight management or sees overweight patients? Very cool. Who here has ever fed a child or hung out with a child or cared for a child? Everyone, probably. So this all relates to you. I hope you leave with some, some good tips. We're going to start out by talking about the patient visit and really how to work with the patient when they're there in your office or in a clinic room. Um, luckily, with the help of Liza and Katie, we have some um, patient inf or information directly from a patient to help teach us what they're looking for. Um, and then we're going to dress into what I see as the three most common barriers that you'll see to family success in pediatric weight management. So it's really important in a patient visit that we're able to start things off right. Of course, um, we would love for our patients to come in with these big grins that you see on these pictures here and be thrilled to see the doctor or the dietitian. But especially in the setting of pediatric weight management, sadly, they're not usually absolutely thrilled to see me the first time. My goal is to change that so the second visit, they, they do come with a smile on their face. But often there's a lot of tension, there's a little bit of anxiety. Um, many of my patients think that I'm gonna work them out like Jillian Michaels and they're gonna be yelled at at that first visit. Many people think that we're gonna blame the parents. There's a lot of feelings, a lot of emotional baggage that can come to that first visit. So my best piece of advice there is to provide a really warm welcome. Um, we all know how great it feels when you arrive somewhere and someone's looking forward to seeing you, whether it's that they gave you a really nice bag when you arrived tonight or offered you water. Um, some of those really silly, simple little things about welcoming a family and making sure they feel comfortable in the setting, especially because it's your comfort zone, not theirs, um, can really help to start things off right and show that you care. I also very much encourage getting to know your patients. Sometimes that's not easy when you have many patients to see and not a lot of time. Um, I've tried a few different approaches to try getting information from my, parent, my patients or getting to know them. Um, one of my favorite ways, especially for young elementary age kids, is to say, tell me three things that make you awesome. And boy, when they're put on the spot like that, you get the most adorable responses. Um, Sometimes when I'm working with teenagers, I'll ask, what's something cool that you've done this week? Or what are you excited about this next week? Or what's going on in school? Just to get kind of feel, get a feel for what's important to them, what drives them, getting to know them beyond just as a patient provider relationship. Who here is familiar with AIDET, A-I-D-E-T? Okay, so some people have been introduced to this. This was a new initiative in the past year at the University of Virginia Children's Hospital, and it's just an acronym. You know, there are a million acronyms in medicine. This one is to really provide a warm environment for the patient. It's pretty simple. I found that it's things that I tend to do anyway, but it's a nice reminder that acknowledging the patient and who else is there with them. I know that sometimes can be confusing or a little bit of a challenge um, working in pediatrics. I often will have the child introduce me to everyone. My favorite way to do it is just say, hi, you must be Johnny. Can you tell me who else is here with you today? Or do you even know these people who walked in with you? A playful um, way of, of getting them to introduce the family is a great way to start things off. 
I always give them a heads up of about how long um, that visit's gonna take. Just how Dr. Levine went through how long tonight's gonna be in the different portions of it. It's nice if they know what they're getting into, so some of those questions that might be going on in their head can be answered right away. An explanation of kind of your role. I often say, I'm the food lady, we're gonna talk a lot about what you eat and how to eat healthier. A really simple, playful way to say it is, is a nice way to introduce it. And part of Aid It is always ending with a thank you. Thanking people for their time, showing appreciation that you're there. A piece of Aid It that's not in the actual five steps there is also building up the rest of the team. So if you're seeing a patient alongside another provider, building up who's coming in next, um, easing fears about that. Um, I love to say, um, next year you're gonna see Dr. Rapass, he's kind of silly, but I think you'll really like him. Or even say, saying, um, there's a different nurse practitioner you'll see tomorrow today, her name's Suzanne, and she's gonna take great care of you. Things like that can help to ease some of those emotion or the fear that comes with that um, first visit. And more than anything, it's important that we're sensitive to those emotions, that we recognize them and that we try to work through them. And to tell you a little bit more about that, let's see. If I hit end show, is that the best way? Yeah. We're going to have one of the patients tell us a little bit about what they would want. I feel like uh, for a nutritionist to help me, they have to be more sensitive to um, the whole topic because I know from my friends and other people when they deal with this subject that um, if they hear something that they don't like to hear or that brings down their confidence, they kind of get closed off about it and they don't really want to hear what the person is saying. So I feel like taking it a different way and really being sensitive and being cautious and just knowing how the person feels about the topic and going into that, I think that's a, it's a better way to deal with it. Couldn't have said it better myself. I thought she did a beautiful job of explaining some of those emotions that happen, especially with that first visit. Um, so has anyone ever worked with a family where you kind of felt like they were acting like the Simpsons here during a visit? Anyone ever had tense visits? I see a lot of nodding heads that that tension can come in a variety of ways. Every once in a while it can come in more of a physical ma manner or a vocal manner. Um, whenever there is that tense environment, which Thinking back, there's many poignant visits where I can remember where there was tension between the teenager and her father where one wouldn't talk and then would erupt with a lot of thoughts, um, or maybe between two different caregivers who weren't necessarily on the same page. When that tension happens, I always try to honor their struggles, to recognize this isn't easy. Um, people have busy lives, and when there are health concerns there, it, it's not easy. It, it struggles, you know, inevitable there. Um, I think allowing those emotions to happen is appropriate and also especially I like to have, even if there's a tense environment, have it happen in front of me rather than on the car ride home. I'd like to see kind of what's going on, get a feel for how the family interacts and how they support each other. And more than anything, provide comfort. Um, that comfort sometimes can come in just moving the box of tissues closer to them. It might come in um, a nice touch on the shoulder to reassure them. It might come in just being quiet and letting them talk through their feelings. I always try not to pretend that I have all the answers because I surely don't. Um, trying to keep that neutral tone of not agreeing or disagreeing, but more letting them talk and um, affirming their thoughts can be helpful. And more than anything, trying not to immediately change a subject, but allowing them to kind of work through their own thoughts can be really helpful there. The, next, the question I get most often about a patient visit, um, whether it's I'm teaching medical students or physicians about pediatric weight management or nursing students, or other dietitians, the question I always get is, how do you address weight? How do you talk about that? Um, I always start by the, the obvious. I never use the word fat. I think that's often thrown out there, sometimes by the families or the patients themselves. It's not a word that I use in my vocabulary. Um, I try to really approach it in medical fashion, what I've learned from the physicians and nurse practitioners who I work with. And much like Dr. Gallagher said, that we use BMI charts um, to show patients where they are, where we'd like them to be. We explain how we're gonna help them to get there. Um, and we try to educate them a little bit about what our, our plan is overall. Many people ask, do you do this in front of the child? I think that you can do this in front of them if you approach it in kind of a medical fashion and don't dwell on this too much. Um, but there might be times where it's better to have this education more for the parent um, and not so much the child. 
We definitely focus on overall health of the, the entire family because one thing we know with nutrition is it's really hard to change one family member's eating habits without changing, without other people being willing to make some changes too. So rather than single out, singling out the patient or the parent that they spend the most time with, we really talk about the entire family unit there. Now communication isn't the easiest thing in one of these visits. When you have 100 questions to ask, you're trying to either write down your answers or chart them in the medical record, and you're trying to keep a somewhat normal conversation going. Um, but we have a little help in, in figuring out exactly um, how we can go through some of those communication challenges. Um, we can go back to our patient here for a second. Uh, I feel that to approach this topic, I mean, I know from personal experience that there have been some doctors that have straight out told me, like, listen, you gained a lot of weight and you shouldn't be at this place and you actually look really big. And um, I didn't really like that because it made my confidence go down. I didn't feel like confident in my own skin and I feel that um, the best way I think that would get through to me is to sit me down and say, listen, your health is a very important factor um, in living your life, living a healthy life. And uh, part of that is eating right and um, knowing how much to eat and knowing your, uh, basically knowing I think it's adorable how she ended that there. That shows this isn't an easy topic to talk about, right? Um, but I like how she kind of, my take home there was that scare tactics don't work. Um, scare tactics can be an easy way to go, um, but often in kids or in these families, they already are coming in scared. So using a scare tactic or going straight at um, the problem right away can really not be a warm way to start things out. Often there's this really ugly feeling of guilt that accompanies parents and sometimes even the child at these visits. Um, recognizing those negative feelings and helping to process them can be really helpful. I'll never forget, it was probably, oh, I bet it was seven years ago or so, I saw a 14-year-old competitive swimmer who was obese, and she was in there with her mother and her father. And her father, I, the nurse practitioner saw her first, and the nurse practitioner came out and let me know that dad was pretty angry. Um, he might have had fire coming out of his eyes when, when she left the room. He threatened to not pay for the visit because there was nothing wrong with his child, with her eating or her exercise. Um, he needed tests done and was very demanding about what he expected from the care and was 100% certain it wasn't nutrition or activity driven. And he really wanted more medical tests done. And of course, she tried talking through a more balanced, um, full assessment approach. But it said, you know, if by the end of this visit, you don't feel like you've gotten anything out of it, we won't have you pay for it. That's fine. You know, we'll work with you. And I remember going into this room and I'd heard about how angry dad was. And I was surprised when I walked in, he actually was the quietest person there. He did not look comfortable sitting there, but he was the quietest person. And his meek um, teenage daughter started answering the questions and mom filled in. Um, and the visit was going well until we got towards the end of, of my assessment portion and dad started speaking. And it was evident from the beginning, he was angry. He was very angry. Um, he had said comments like he was sick of people judging him for his daughter being overweight and thinking they were bad parents. He was sick of people thinking that she didn't have healthy habits because of how she looked. And in listening to him talk through all this, um, I was very new still and, and wasn't sure how to respond, but I chose, I think looking back was the best approach. I just listened. And then I tried using some of those motivational interviewing skills that we learn early on of, it sounds like that this has been a really stressful experience for you. It sounds like you feel judged things like that, and it really opened up this conversation that showed that this father was so proud of his daughter. He was very proud that she was a competitive swimmer and was very confident that she was already practicing healthy behaviors, and he didn't like how he felt judged and knew that she felt judged and he couldn't do anything about it. And so when you have those really intense emotions, um, it can be hard to get through your what you think the visit's going to look like, but it's really important you allow those to happen um, and you help the family to process them. Try not to neglect or ignore those insecurities if they're willing to share them with you. Um, I also am always open to any questions. I know that we've all probably had visits where we got some kind of crazy questions um, that might have seemed a little bit off base, like should my child have any carbs? Or uh, my favorite one I ever heard from a patient was, um, a mother, and this was not the first visit, who had a question at the end of the visit. It was a very serious question. She wanted to know if it was okay if she fed her child just the fat on meat because that was a part he liked. 
And I see some faces in the audience. And that was a face of my intern who was with me during that visit that I still can remember. Questions like that, they might seem kind of wild to us. Those are important enough for the family to ask. We need to respect them, honor the fact that they're asking questions, aren't engaged, and help them define um, the appropriate information that they're looking for related to those. And of course, when it comes to the emotional piece, there could be varying levels there. Just because the first visit was pretty emotional, the second visit wasn't, it doesn't mean that emotion won't come back up. So just being prepared for it is, is helpful. Validating those emotions, but also at times, especially if it's an emotion of guilt, really challenging how that emotion is, is serving them now once you get to know the family better and can work with them, um, and really encourage processing those emotions and moving on to the next step. We often will talk to families about how um, the past has happened and we're not making any judgments for it, we're moving forward. So decisions are made, food's bought and prepared to the best of your ability at the time. There's often many different competing priorities for families and making sure that you recognize that, um, but also recognize that they're, he they're meeting with you, they're investing their time, their energy, that shows a certain level of motivation right there and honoring that, respecting that, thanking them for coming um, are great ways to help them move on through those emotions. Um, trying to be as supportive as, as possible. And another thing that I, I never thought early on that I'd have to do this, I thought everyone assumed that you know perfection is, is not reachable. Um, so they wouldn't assume that was my goal, but I found many of my patients, if I didn't directly convey to them kind of what my expectations were, that they would assume my expectations were up here. Um, it's the same reason why any dietitians in this audience, I've probably had a colleague or a friend comment that they didn't want to eat lunch with them because they're worried they might be judged for what food's on their plate. Like we don't, I'm not judging people's meals next to me. I always usually say, if, if, um, if you pay me, I'll, I'll give you comments on your food. But that's not something that, that we do. We're, we're looking for small improvements for our patients, um, but we're not looking for perfection there. And sometimes straight out telling your patient that can help to set their expectations and ease some of those fears that they have to make a lot of changes quickly. As you've heard a couple times now, keeping it positive is, is really important. Um, framing that assessment um, with questions, with curiosity, not judgment. Sometimes that can be difficult. Um, often when I'm asking about some of those food behavior questions, I'll say, I have some silly questions for you, but if it's okay, we'll just go through them. And then I ask in very calm tone, do you ever sneak or hide food? Does it ever feel like your eating's out of control or you can't stop? Those are questions that very easily could be said with some judgment or some implication there, but if you kind of preface it and have a really calm tone, um, that can be helpful in, in moving toward, moving through your assessment without judgment. Um, focusing on what's going well and building momentum with goals. I always like to um, say that we look for the low hanging fruit with goal setting. We look for what would be an easy change to make and how to build momentum. Um, one strategy that the clinic that I worked at um, really used is the idea of setting multiple goals. I know some people will only set one goal per visit because that's truly what's achievable. We took the approach of sometimes setting four or five goals because we'd find that if we set um, a goal about trying to have the family eat together, a goal about um, decreasing sugary drinks, and a goal about um, trying to eat breakfast every morning. That if they come back um, and just did well on one of those, that's something we can grab a hold of and build going forward. Where if we just said, let's work on cutting back on sugary beverages, and dad, who wasn't at that visit, had went out to Costco and had bought um, a bunch of soda because it was on sale, that creates a challenge for that family. It might be hard to meet that one goal. So sometimes we would um, give them more opportunities to help build momentum and have that first step for success early on. Word choice is a whole nother piece um, that's incredibly important here. Um, I love this quote here. It's one I had never heard before. Be sure to taste your words before you spit them out. And I know that the assessment piece with um, patients and also the education piece took a lot of practice to really feel comfortable with and feel like the word choices were appropriate. Um, we always try to frame our questions with thoughtfulness, with curiosity, um, trying to keep it non-judgmental, if I mentioned. And if you ever reach a point in a visit where it seems like things are a little bit awkward or you're not sure where to go next or someone just dropped a bomb that you weren't prepared for, um, I always go with these. Uh, tell me more. How do you feel about that? Sometimes I'll just bounce it over to other fe uh, another family member. Of, Would you agree with that? Or, or how do you feel that's going? And the best answer, I think, sometimes in those tough situations is silence. Um, I found that silence is often more powerful than anything I can say because it gives the family an opportunity to really fill in more information. Now when we talk about it being a family affair, it's really important to involve the entire family in nutrition education. I'll give you guys a quick demo of uh, something that I started doing very early on in working with this population um, when it comes to nutrition education. It became difficult sometimes, especially when we talk about portion control, and that's a 
primary topic, they'll come up at some point to work with um, multiple family members and try to individualize it. So something I, I started doing really early on is if you all put your hands out in front of you like this, it's a trick we use to show people about how much food they need at a meal. You need just enough food to cover your hands. So if you compare your hands with the person next to you, you can see who needs more, who needs less. <laughs> now this usually gets some giggles because most of us have about the same size hands. Men's hands are a little bit larger, women's maybe a little bit smaller. But I'll tell you, whenever I teach this to medical students, they get pretty um, competitive with whose hands are bigger and who needs more food. Um, I know a lot of questions are probably swirling through your head, but I'll show you exactly how we use this. Jackie, do you mind coming up? Um, so if Jackie has her hands out, this is how I work with families. I actually have the whole family put their hands out like this. And we say your whole meal should be just enough food to cover your hands. The first part of any meal should be some type of a meat or protein, chicken, fish, beef, pork, beans, nuts, peanut butter. Jackie's gonna get some chicken here. It should be the size of her palm. Her other palm we'd like to be a whole grain, preferably brown rice, wheat noodles, wheat bread. But it really can be any grain, and although some might to not totally put this into the grain group, what's most kids' favorite grain? Pasta. Specifically what type of pasta? Mac and cheese. So if they're having mac and cheese, it could go here and be the size of home. Um, what about her fingers and what would go in her fingers? Yeah, fruits and vegetables. Now are Jackie's hands filled? Her thumbs, yes. If you're thinking like a kid, her thumbs are very empty here. But her thumbs part of her fingers or part of her palm? Their fingers, right? So that means if we put a piece of broccoli here, a grape over here, her hands would be full. Um, this is about how much food she would need at a meal. But let's say she's really hungry. Is there any way to make her hands bigger? Spreading out her fingers. So there's room for more foods, but where is the room for more foods? On her fingers or on her palms? And what foods go on her fingers? Fruits and veggies. You guys are exactly right. So if you want seconds, the healthiest way to go is always more fruits and vegetables. Not the only way, but the healthiest. Do you want to dump those down? So just to make sure we all remember this, can you help Jackie teach it back to me? What do we start out with? First part of a meal should be your, and it should be the size of your? Palm. Awesome. Do you want to put them on my hands? Mm -hmm. And my other palm? Grain. Grain. Now most of you probably could guess that protein and grains are not words that many kids know, so I had a patient who once told me that this was her meats and her weeds. That works too. <laughs> what about my fingers? What foods go there? And if I'm really, really hungry, I can have more. Thanks so much. Great job. Um, so you all see this. I'll stay by my microphone. Um, you see the shape this makes? Can you use some imagination of those kids that you work with? You kind of see a smiley face? So the smiley face is a really cheesy way that we teach what balanced meals look like. It doesn't mean you have to cook five foods in a meal. It does mean you want half the plate to be fruits and vegetables. So it's just fine if half the plate is all broccoli. We just want to make sure that half the plate's filled there. Now the beauty of this is if you're working with a family who has a four-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a 16-year-old, are these foods all going to fit on each one's hands the same way? No. You actually, I use different size um, food models to really show the difference there. And while you guys can imagine this isn't a perfect science, it actually is pretty close. You know, when we think about appropriate serving sizes for adults, being a half cup of, of pasta, um, three ounce of meat, that's what these are, and they fit pretty well on my palms. If you're working with a four-year-old, where it'd be one ounce of meat and about a fourth cup of pasta, <laughs> I'm always blown away by how well those food models will fit on the kids', kids hands. So it works really well as a way to teach family members um, portion control and why they're different amounts. I know that I've struggled often with um, siblings. I work with a lot of siblings um, where you'd have a eight-year-old girl and a 15-year-old boy and she didn't feel it was fair that he got more food than her. The hands solve that really quickly. The other thing the hands do is they don't limit the food. They say if, you're, if you want seconds, you always can get more fruits and vegetables. And when I'm first starting to work with a family, I don't limit them to just the size of protein that fits in their palm. We just say one serving at a time. So if you want a bigger piece of chicken than this, that's fine, just start out with this. Eat everything on your plate. If you're still hungry, go back and get another piece, same size or smaller. There are many ways you can work through that. You know, wait 10 minutes before you go back for more, big glass of water before seconds, um, get some more fruits or vegetables with it. The other 
other thing that we use, because many families have different food preferences, is we actually have pictures of the smiley face that looked like. I have a couple hundred pictures of my own meals, patient meals, and my interns' meals that look like smiley faces. If anybody would like those, you always can email me. I'd be more than happy to share them. But it can help to go through and really show a family meals that make sense to them or fit in their typical diet, too. There are other ways you can expand it. We always say that... Um, when you think about a, your, a smiley face, the most important part of a smile is, of course, the mouth. That means the fruits and vegetables are most important part of the plate. We should eat those first. We also say meals fit in two hands. It means snacks should fit in one. So there's many ways that you can build that for the whole family, um, especially when the whole family is there. That education typically goes very well. The challenge is often the whole family isn't there. But I'll tell you, most kids, especially elementary age kids who almost all want to be teachers when they grow up, love to go home and teach that to other family members. So encouraging that as a goal can be helpful too. We talked a little bit about helping to set up those appropriate expectations and responsibilities, um, trying to help develop some accountability through teamwork, really encouraging the family to work together, uh, maybe having partners in some of those goal setting things. If someone's going to be drinking water before each meal, have someone else they're drinking it with and they're racing each other. Siblings tend to really enjoy that. So you can drink a glass of water the fastest before the meal starts to help to fill them up. Things like that can be fun. We also practice problem solving, work through those barriers um, and some of those concerns. Um, pass the microphone is what I like to call just getting everyone's buy-in from things. I find it very interesting in visits when siblings are there. You know, the visit's not about the sibling, but boy, are they usually the, the most excited to talk to you. And really getting information from everyone who's there, kind of passing that microphone, allowing everyone the opportunity to speak, kind of see what they think about the goals, where they'd like to go next, um, how they feel things are going. It gives you a lot more information. It also makes a visit more fun for everyone. It doesn't put as much pressure on the patient themselves. It makes the whole family feel like they're um, important, which they very much are in this process, and really gets their buy-in, too. Um, and if they're family members who aren't there, I think the best thing you can do is make that invitation for them to come next. Um, if we find that grandma is a sabotager, as we sometimes call, and doesn't like to follow some of those healthy eating guidelines, one of the goals we'll actually set is to invite grandma to the next visit um, so that she can hear some of the education and so that the child actually can help teach her um, in front of the whole group. It usually is very successful when we're able to do that. So there are some tough calls. Um, I've really struggled with who's responsible when, when I've heard these type of quotes during clinic, and I've heard these quite often. The, I just let them go and grab a snack whenever they're hungry. Um, that comment's come to me before about three or four-year-olds um, who typically don't always know what hunger um, means and how that relates to boredom or to their favorite snack is in the snack drawer and there's only four left, um, things like that. This isn't my problem. Sometimes I'll have pa parents who will say that, um, or I don't know. When you ask, how many snacks a day does a child usually eat? And the parent goes, I don't know. I said, well, what about yesterday after school? Were you home with them? Yep. You know how many snacks they had? I don't know. That's a tough one, too, when the family isn't as involved to provide some of that background information. Um, I really try to go back to that whole teamwork emphasis. Um, accountability is a really complicated word, but trying to make sure everyone understands what their roles are, how important their role is, how it fits with ev everyone else in the family's roles um, can be really helpful. Um, if tension exists, helping to explore that and kind of see what some of those barriers are. Also looking to who can support them. If something's difficult, if they don't know how many snacks their child has, is there another person in the family who might know? Is there a way that they could help um, kind of get an idea of, of what's going on? Um, it can be hard to kind of determine who can help support the family members who are there, but the best way to find out is asking them. Is there anyone else who helps you out with the care or anyone else who might be able to help work on these goals? I think it's also important to say, how can I help? It sounds like that's a challenge of snacking after school. What can I do to help you with that? What can I do to help build a healthier environment for you? Um, it opens up the conversation a bit. More than anything, I like to talk about the power of role modeling. Um, I like this, don't worry, the children never listen to you. Worry, they're always watching you. And I think this is evident anytime you see um, a little two-year-old who has a sassy comment that's exactly what her, his or her mother or father would say. Um, but just like we talked about the ultimate team as a family, the ultimate role model is a parent. And in the process of going through um, uh, nutrition education and trying to make some healthy lifestyle changes, it's not just the patient who's going to have to grow and change, and hopefully that's a pleasant and exciting experience, but it's the parents too. It's the entire family. And with that, we're going to jump into a little bit about some of those common challenges. So we've talked about the patient visit. Um, in all the patients I've seen, and I 
have to, if, when I had to think about what are the biggest challenges I see most often, it was pretty easy to come up with this list of three. We have really busy lives. Often it's not just a mother and father involved in the care of a child. It's usually a very different situation than um, the typical family that um, probably was more common um, a, few dec a couple decades ago. And picky eating. Picky eating is a tough one. So we're going to explore those during the rest of this time. Talking about a busy schedule, um, I think it's really important just to set realistic goals. Um, you don't want to go in having you or the family think that this very, very busy family who has a lot going on is going to be able to change everything in the next week. Um, making sure that we're focusing on what, what can they do. Specifically, focusing maybe on one meal. Often, um, if dinner's too difficult because there are many sports practices or activities going on, we'll talk about breakfast. Or maybe we'll focus on lunch that they pack and packing that together. So focusing on just one little specific thing can be really helpful. Um, or maybe we'll focus on weekends. If that's when they have more time, I find most of my families feel that Sunday afternoons or evenings are when they have the most time the whole week to, during the whole week together. Focusing on that can be helpful. Um, we also talk a lot about sports seasons or different activity seasons. You know, um, if one goal is to eat together as a family, I found for most of my families, if it's during a sports season where more than one child's involved in sports, that's not the time to work on sitting together at dinner because it's almost impossible. That might be a better time to talk about healthy snacks. Snacks are a really important piece with those busy schedules. So making sure that if it's a very, very busy family where that busyness isn't going to go away, it might be important that you adjust your mindset on where you're going with those nutrition goals. Um, with a lot of the families who are very busy, I'll, and they'll comment about how busy things have been, how hectic things have been, I'll say, do you see things calming down anytime soon? And most often the answer is no, or not for a couple months. So it's really important to keep in mind when you're thinking about which goals you're setting. Um, and vacations always throw a curveball in there. So making sure that you anticipate those adjusted expectations during vacations, not that those should be cheat days or cheat times, but those should be part of life that we can try to make as healthy as of decisions as possible. But that regardless of what happens, it's important that we come back from vacation and kind of get back to our goals. We always look for those opportunities for those small improvements. Um, looking for the slowest, least stressful time of the week or time of the month to really kind of refocus and, and set some of those goals and work towards them. Um, asking where they see opportunity for improvement. I'll often have visits where families spend a good portion of the time telling me about how busy they've been, how many things are going on. Um, it's really tough when sometimes it's you know because of deaths in the family or different family members being hospitalized or extra people in their home um, that cause a lot of extra stress. And that's when I'll ask them where they see opportunities for improvement. And sometimes there are months that go by where um, they don't feel it's a good time to be setting nutrition goals. And I, I think that's okay. The important thing is that they're coming and they're checking in and that when they're ready to start working on those nutrition goals again and have a better environment for it, that we can jump back into it. This might seem a little silly, but I, I'm a big person when it comes to facing any problem. Let's see every resource possible and how can we use it. And so if we have busy families, I encourage trying to do neighborhood or family dinners where maybe once a week you're getting together with others and you rotate who prepares it. So rather than having to prepare that family meal every single week on Sunday nights, if you're rotating with two other families, that can take some of the pressure off um, and can also give you more support. Um, some families might have um, financial situations that allow them to look into food delivery options. You could help navigate some of the healthier options for them. Also looking for healthier, healthier frozen and canned meals. I have a couple handouts I use for that, um, which are some of the most popular ones that my patients like. Speaking of handouts, um, in your packet, after the slides, you'll see one that might look like the most boring patient education handout you've ever seen, but I'll tell you it's one of the most effective ones. It's about fish. Um, this was one we created probably over five years ago, and I had interns who created this. Um, the, just, the purpose of this is if you have frozen fish in your freezer or buy some fresh or frozen fish from the grocery store, here are many different ways. I think it's at least 10 different ways you can cook fish in very simple easy ways. Um, I found in working with a lot of families, while I like to cook and I'm pretty comfortable in the kitchen, a lot of the families who I work with are not. And so having some very, very simple ones and being able to highlight some of your favorites. My favorite is to take frozen tilapia and put it um, in the oven just on a pan and put a little bit of orange marmalade on it. Sounds gross, but it's delicious and it's so easy and it cooks in less than 20 minutes. Being able to talk through them, some of those ideas that are, aren't super expensive and aren't really difficult can be helpful. Um, 
if anyone's interested in this and sees a, a usefulness for this, we also have ones on ground beef or ground turkey. We have one on chicken and we have one on beans um, that just once again shows some easy meals you can make when you're in a bind as long as you have a protein source at home. And we also have handouts that we use about microwave cooking. Well, that's not the ideal way to cook. It's quick and a lot of kids can do that on their own. So being open to helping them figure out ways to cook that might not be the traditional um, best case scenario, but being more flexible can be really helpful there too. Um, who here has worked with a family where it was um, a unique situation where it wasn't just mom and dad involved with the family's care? I would guess most of us have, right? Um, the family unit has really changed over time. Uh, I find it awesome and fascinating to see how different families make things work with different players involved. I found with a lot of my patients that grandparents have bigger roles, um, or one grandparent might. Uh, many of my families live in um, homes where they have either aunts or uncles or cousins who also live in their homes. Um, there are many blended families or single parent families. Um, I work with a lot of foster children as well as um, teenagers who live in group homes. So it's important you recognize that family situation, um, who plays a role in the child's food and nutrition choices um, and help to work with them. More than anything, I sound like a record on repeat here, but keeping it positive is so important. A lot of times when you have multiple caregivers playing a lot of different roles, there are many challenges there. And just trying to applaud their efforts even in coming to a visit. Whenever I have more than one caregiver at a visit, I always take a moment to say to the child, especially if they're younger, wow, you are so special. Both of your parents took time away from their day to be here with you. Or to the parents, if it's a teenager, if I know it's really tough to get off work and get to the, all these doctor visits, but it's really cool that you took time to be here. Those things are important to really encourage them and encourage that involvement. Um, I also always note special relationships. I like getting as many family members into the visit as possible because you can tell by interaction who the child most respects, who they most try to be like, who kind of plays the hard-nosed game that they um, are the enforcer of the rules. Um, and you can really feel out what would be appropriate goals or ways to engage different family members. I've often had um, parents who aren't very... They don't have the skills to provide a, a structure or to provide um, choices and consequences. They have much more of a relaxed nature of parenting and might not have some of those skills um, in discipline or in structure. And it's important to recognize um, there are ways that we can help them through that. Where there are different family classes and ways that our uh, medical providers can help work with them to develop those skills. But it's also important to see who else is involved in the home, who can help provide some of that structure, who can make sure that there are breakfast foods in the home. Um, so really understanding those special relationships and the different role people play is very helpful. Um, one of the best tools we have for that is we have an open-ended sentence question questionnaire that we give to patients before the first visit that has things like, um, I am most happy when, if I had one wish, it would be my grandma is. Things like that and seeing the child fill that out can really give you some insight on the different role players in the family. I think the biggest challenge with multiple caregivers is that consistent messaging. Um, there's nothing more difficult when um, dad tries really hard to make sure there are only healthy snacks at home, but grandma lives two blocks away and the child knows there's really delicious snacks at grandma's house. Um, so if you're not having the same message for caregivers, it can be difficult. I've also seen many times where if there's not consistent messaging between a daycare and the family's home, there can be challenges. Um, I'll have parents who say, I just found out last week that my child's having two dinners every night. Um, because I didn't know they were giving him day, she was, the child was saying she was hungry at daycare and so she was getting a meal there and then coming home and saying she hadn't eaten. Those little lapses in communication can be really challenging. So encouraging that communication in whatever facet works best for them, whether it's written notes or texts or kind of doing a check-in meeting once a week, whatever really works for them, that consistent messaging is really important. It's also important to have open discussions. There shouldn't be blame or, or guilt there. Um, I've had many different patient interactions where we have um, parents who are separated and are in new relationships with new families and there's a lot of tension or blaming even to the silliest things like well they have whole milk at that house <laughs> and it's important that you kind of remove that and you just open up the discussion of we're all on the same team here and we're going to do what, what we can to the best of our ability um, and help problem solve together and, and make sure that it's not a competition it's all working together as one team there. Helping to set up some of those boundaries can be helpful too, especially when you have caregivers who um, might see themselves, and this often tends to be the grandparents who um, don't have to really follow the family rules, even if they have the child every day of the week, that they're the fun grandparent, that's their role. But helping to set some boundaries or some structure they're comfortable with um, that they can maintain is important too. And of course, we try to engage the full family. 
key to, it's key to having those conversations together, having them out in the open, removing that blame and guilt, and exploring how you can better support each other. Opening up that question can be really interesting. And the final piece we're going to talk about here is the challenge of picky eating. Anyone here know a picky eater? Anyone here who might be a picky eater? <laughs> picky eating is a big, big challenge. Um, there's a lot of, of great information out there about how to work with picky eating. I know that um, you had mentioned Ellen Satter and her materials can help to kind of guide you through picky eating. I found it needs to be very individualized. Um, there are lots of different tools in your toolbox that are needed depending on the, the family or patient. Um, what I encourage for families is to plan ahead, um, allow some choices. So we typically follow the guidelines of make sure there's at least one food at every meal that your child enjoys and then have some of those another challenging food or food that they might not typically enjoy, but you can encourage them to try. Um, and we try as much as possible to choose acceptance and positivity because I know that some of us, myself included, um, were a bit scarred when I was young when I was forced to try liver and onions. I, that was something my parents liked to cook once in a while, and of course I was very disgusted by it. My parents very much had a clean plate policy, and I've never had liver and onions since I've moved out of my parents' home and don't plan to. And so you can see when you have those negative experiences or where something's forced upon you, um, it can really shut you down to wanting to be open to in the future. So trying to choose acceptance, positivity, um, willingness to work through um, the patient's thoughts, the child's thoughts are important. Looking for opportunities for independence is another key. Um, I'm always amazed by how excited a young child gets when they get to pour their own milk into their cereal. Um, that that feeling of independence is really exciting for any child. Um, providing options can help to give them that sense of independence um, or for young children trying to distract them in other ways so they're not so focused on the food at the table um, but maybe they're helping with setting the table or leading the conversation or maybe they're decorating the centerpiece there's another piece they're involved in rather than just what's on their plate um, a perfect example of distraction um, was one of my uh, friends got her three-year-old to eat peas something she very much didn't like by playing the game of being a vacuum you all can see where that's going right that rather than eating peas with a fork or a spoon, you suck them up like you were a vacuum. And all of a sudden, her three-year-old loved eating peas. Now, of course, that's not going to work with all ages, but I think some creativity there um, and some distraction at times can be very helpful. There are also lots of strategies you can use for different ages. Um, other resources in your packet. Um, the 13 ways to get kids excited about veggies has all of my favorite tips. Some of, I bet a lot of them are ones that you all have been exposed to, um, but I like like the blindfolded taste test where you turn it into a game and everyone takes bites. I like the idea of having them fill out um, like a quick little questionnaire, like their opinion is very important. You know, is it they liked it and they circle a smiley face, they weren't sure and it's a you know expressionless face or if it was a sad face if they didn't like it. That can be a fun way to work through this. The other um, handouts here that I found to be incredibly important, starting with the taste matters. Has anyone here been exposed to flavor families? Probably something you've heard a little bit about. I was at a conference a couple years ago where there was a flavor uh, or a food scientist, so it was a dietitian who's worked in the food industry for years, who now has a private practice where she really educates others. And um, you can see her information at the bottom of this handout that one of my interns put together, but talks about flavor families. So just looking at the Taste Matters handout, if you look at the bottom, there's vegetables and there are different columns of vegetables. How I use this with patients is I actually would have them go through and highlight or circle the foods that they like from that, those columns. After they're finished, you look to see is there one column that most of the foods they like fall into. And if you guys had a glance there, which, which types, which flavors of vegetables would you say typically are kids' favorites? The sweet ones, right? Yeah, sometimes the, the mild or neutral ones are. Sometimes even the grassy ones I find for some of the kids I work with. Um, now, referring to them as grassy is not a way to get <laughs> the kids to eat them more. But what the purpose of this is you can identify which foods they like and how a family can utilize this handout is if they like mostly sweet vegetables, Trying the other vegetables in that same category would be step one to introducing new foods. Step two is trying foods in adjacent columns. Those are ones most closely related. Step three would be looking for all the vegetables that are in bold. Are actually, they actually appear in two different columns, so jumping to that other column that they appear in. Um, many times with picky eating, you can use a lot of creative strategies, but I found many parents who just feel lost. They said, you know, I tried these four foods and I have no idea where to go. This gives you a little bit of science that can help them to lead um, down paths that they might be more successful. There's the exact same thing with fruits, and as you can imagine, the next page it says texture trials. It's the exact same thing with texture. So one of the first questions I ask when we're really talking about picky eating is, is it more of a taste thing or is it the texture of different foods? Um, 
that can be a challenge there. So we've addressed some of those barriers. Um, talking a little bit about take-home messages. Now, um, take, you had a question? Sure. Sure, I'd be happy to. Sure, so um, going back to the taste matters, this bottom um, chart here, first you have them circle or highlight every vegetable that they like, that they would eat. That might only be a couple. <laughs> you look for which column has the most circles in it, which one has the most vegetables they like. You encourage the family as their first step to trying new vegetables would be try other vegetables that fall in that same column. So if a child likes carrots and corn are the only vegetables they like, those are both in the sweet column. They'll probably be most successful if they try other vegetables that also are from that sweet flavor family. Now this isn't a surefire proof um, way that you're gonna get kids to love every vegetable in that column, but at least it gives you a bit of strategy so you're not kind of shooting wildly as far as what, what foods that they might like. After they've tried ones in that column, you try foods in the the columns that are um, in adjacent columns, those are the ones most closely related flavor-wise. The third step would be look for any of the vegetables that are in bold. Those appear in two columns. You try the, the foods that are in the other column that that same vegetable would appear in. The texture one works the exact same way. So I've just dumped a ton of information on you all. And I know you all have great experiences to share too. Um, so whenever I talk about take-home messages with an audience, I think it's kind of funny to have the take-home messages coming from me because I don't know what messages you thought were important enough to take home. So I have a little bit of chocolate bribery if anyone would like to share with me something that um, stood out to them or something they thought might be helpful in practice. Or it could be something you didn't even hear from me, but maybe something you do yourself. Anyone? That you need to involve the whole family. I think a lot of times in nutrition education programs, people ask me, um, oh, so you're, um, you know, are you giving the children lessons? You know, are you giving the children food advice or tips? But they're not the ones that actually are uh, in charge of what foods they are going to eat. It's really the parents. So it's really important to have the, the parents on board too. Um, I was going to say that this, I think, is one of the first times that I heard of the idea of having the kids out of the room, like if it's appropriate to just talk to the parent by themselves, because I do feel that sometimes, and I'm like, this is a little bit weird for the kid to be listening to all this as, you know, we're working through it. Um, so I think that's a really good tool to use. And that's a great point. There's actually been a lot of research about what's best. And I found that it's just incredibly individualized. Typically for older kids, they like that autonomy of being separated from the parent. But I really try to keep the whole family in there as much as possible because I try to word things in a comfortable way for everyone. So if there are discussions at home that they all heard the same thing, um, but it's very individualized. I actually have a question. Um, I find very often the Parents will come, walk in in the beginning, they'll come to the meeting, and then after that, they want to wash their hands from it, and now your my child is your responsibility, and get them on board. So my question is actually, how many times do you find you are working with the whole family? How often do you see them? And when, will you continue seeing the child without the rest of the family? And is, if it becomes mandatory, then you lose them completely, you know, sort of that idea. Oh, thank you. So good chocolate. Um, that's a great question. So in the clinic that I've spent my time in, we actually require the parent there for the visit. Um, so we, for all visits. Um, if a child is 18 or older, which we have some, we see patients up to 21, um, we will allow them to come by themselves. If they're younger than that, every once in a while we'll have a situation where the parent drops them off but sends a note or does a phone call. But we really require some family member to be there. And if the parent isn't able to make it to the visit, that likely means that they have a schedule that they're not spending that time frame, whenever it is, with their child anyway. So there should be some other adult who's involved. I encourage, um, even if there's an aunt or uncle or neighbor who spends some time with the patient, having them at the visit to hear that same information can be really helpful. That is a challenge. Um, 
tons of data out there that retention, <laughs> attrition are huge issues in pediatric weight management. We're actually doing some research looking back at our patients at what affects um, retention and what can help with attrition rates um, and hope to have something published hopefully in the next year. So I have a, a take home and a question. Sure. I loved your open hands mm -hmm. with the palm and the fingers and the thumbs, very clever. Um, and my question is, does that mean that you don't use um, choose my plate? You use this instead of it? So did anyone notice that the hand thing looks a lot like my plate? <laughs> um, so I didn't bring the pictures with me, but we have lots of pictures of that smiley face hands thing. That I developed about a year before my plate came out. And when they came out with my plate, I thought this is perfect because it's saying the same message, half the plate, fruits and vegetables. But what I noticed, and I'm sure you all noticed too, there's something missing in the smiley face, right? There's no dairy. And so we started taking pictures with um, the pictures of the hands with dairy off the side or including dairy on top of some other food that's there or with it. Um, so I use both um, and try to make sure that because many of the kids see that my plate in their schools, I try to make sure that they recognize it's the same thing, same messages. We're not complicating nutrition. We're trying to keep it simple. Great questions. Hi, so I had a question. <clears throat> How do you handle parents that come in? I, I've had some parents come in who just off the bat, they're blaming the child. The child's like 10 or 11. I, I work mostly with adolescents. Um, and they're pretty belligerent about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I've done some things, but I would love to hear kind of your thoughts on how to best handle that. So that's a great question. Um, some of the most depressing times I've ever had with patients are when um, I've had parents who will talk about their teenage daughter saying, she eats like a horse, or talk about their son of, he's so lazy, right in front of them. Um, it's incredibly disturbing. It tells you a lot about what's going on at home, um, the type of talk that happens there. Um, in those situations, I've handled it in a few different ways. Um, I've tried just ignoring it, but it's probably still gonna be said. Typically, I will always follow up with some type of a conversation with the parents, usually not in front of the child with that. Um, I've tried before, earlier on, to try switching it to positivity and really trying to be encouraging, but I find that that doesn't eliminate some of those negative thoughts. Um, sometimes I'll even face it head on if it's a teenager who has heard this before and, and try to explore that more of, you know, that comment, it seems kind of hurtful. Is that, do you think that helps or could we maybe try to eliminate some of that conversation? Um, those can be really tough though. Um, oftentimes I'll also try finding other family members who are more supportive. There have been times where it has been so severe with some of the talk that the other family members and how they're treating the child that we have had to get social work involved or child protective services even um, because there's some emotional abuse going on. So it's something to be aware of and to try to work through. Um, I don't have great answers for that. Yeah. I have another question. <laughs> What's, um, what are some of your strategies for dealing with kids who have multiple caregivers like divorced parents or the grandparent who t takes care of them during the week and keeps buying the sweets or giving the huge plates of rice. How do you get them on, to be part of the team? Good question. Um, best thing that, that you can do is get them in the visit. I think if they hear it from you and feel part of the team, that's helpful. The other thing I always try to do is any information you give to the child and family during the visit, make copies and send them either with the child or via email or mail to every other parent or caregiver and make sure you know you're an important part of this team. We'd really like to see you at the next visit. Um, here's what we talked about. I know it was really important to the patient that you saw this too. Trying to um, maintain that communication as much as possible, but I've also found if they don't wanna be involved, it's really hard to get them involved. And so sometimes, and it's sadly most of the time, you're not gonna get every family member there. Um, I have one patient who I've seen for years that mom's very committed to healthy eating. This is a four-year-old who's morbidly obese already and, and has quite a few comorbidities. And she says every time about how grandma thinks that she's being too sensitive and is gonna cause an eating disorder and dad thinks that it's fine because he's big boned. And they're very 
challenging with it, but mom's very much into it. And so just providing support to her, since she's still coming and is devoted to it, um, but understanding that's gonna exist and sometimes I don't have strategies to work through that, working with if there are other members of your team who might have other strategies that could be helpful too. So what do you do with uh, picky eaters that eat like three foods and expanding what they're eating because parents just make what the kids are going to eat because they don't want to fight with them? So do you have any strategies for that? Um, one thing I'll often try with that is the timing of when you introduce new foods. So you've probably heard the saying that hunger is the best flavoring you can put on any food. So encouraging parents to try, if there's a new food they're trying, start at the beginning of a meal. Um, also taking it very slow, that they don't need to completely change their diet, but maybe at the visit identify three vegetables that they might be willing to try over the next month. Um, I also have a list, it's the most boring, might be even more boring of a handout than the fish one, but it just has a list of a bunch of fruits and a bunch of veggies. And I encourage people to go through and circle the ones they like, star the ones that they're willing to try, cross out the ones they don't like, to really get a, an assessment of how many that they've tried. I find that even for myself, different seasons of the year, I stick to like five vegetables and I don't expand much. And that can be helpful in just kind of seeing where you could go next. But I think bringing down that, that goal to a realistic level. So if the family's only willing to try one new vegetable over the next month, starting there and working forward. What about kids that eat no vegetables? Um, vegetables? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough one. I usually encourage more fruit then. Um, or try to get some vegetables into their food. So I'll just try the strategies of, um, I don't recommend all the way of like pureeing it and putting in foods, but maybe if they cook eggs, trying to put um, some chopped up veggies in it that they might not be able to see, or if they like meatloaf or meatballs, trying to get veggies in that way. Um, that takes a lot more effort though. It can be challenging. Um, I think some of those ideas of making it into a game, the blindfolded taste testing where the child gets to pick out different ones. Um, another strategy that works incredibly well is kids often do what their friends do. So a great place to try new foods is when you have they have a friend over and the friend will eat that vegetable, the child's more likely to, or at their um, other friend's homes where you know that they have a lot of healthy options and maybe have more vegetables. That might be a way to kind of get them into it more. Any other questions or take home messages? So we talked a lot about um, families with really busy schedules. They might not always be eating meals in the home. How do you go about having that conversation um, when it comes to purchasing from restaurants and like specifically kid food at restaurants? Chocolate for you. Um, eating out is inevitable. I try to really make it not a, there isn't one restaurant they need to avoid. There, it's not that we can't eat out. It's important to try finding balance. I think the realistic goals there are really important too. There are lots of different ways you can make healthier choices when eating out. I like to stick to the um, either trying to get kid-sized portions or trying to have a fruit or a vegetable in the meal um, as just some really easy first steps for that. Another tip that I've passed along a lot and actually has worked really well for some of the families when they tend to eat out is usually when they're running home from a different activity or from school and the child's really hungry so they go through a drive through So I'll encourage them, this sounds silly, but to keep either healthy snacks or even like a bag of apples in their car. Apples are pretty cheap. They keep fairly well. And if it's not one of the brutal seasons, um, if you have a bag of apples in your car and you can eat one on the way home, it can help to hold off some of that hunger. Or if you're going to eat out, it already helps to balance it in advance. 